For Karima Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Modi. Joining me today is investigative journalist Karen Morn, here to unpack her latest book, Nuclear, Insights of Africa's Secret Deal. So your book reveals how former President Jacob Zuma tried to push through what you write was a financially suicidal nuclear power deal with Russia. And your book chronicles how destructive his pursuit of this deal was. Can you briefly tell us what this deal entailed? Well, essentially in 2014, just a matter of less than two weeks after Jacob Zuma believed what he, he'd received what he thought was life-saving treatment from poisoning in Russia, Energy Minister Tina Jumat peterson signed an intergovernmental agreement um, with, between South Africa and the Russian nuclear agency Rosatom for, um, you know, a, a, they described it as a cooperation agreement. But essentially, it was the sort of precursor to a far-reaching 9.6 gigawatt nuclear reactor deal that would have eventually, had all those reactors been built, resulted in Russia supplying South Africa with 23% of its energy through nuclear reactors. And the big question marks, of course, which were continuously red flagged by Treasury and other NGOs and those within the civil society space, was this issue of how exactly this deal would be funded. It was estimated to cost about 1 trillion rand. The primary issue that the Treasury had was that there was no feasibility study done for it. And there were real question marks over how it could be financed and what the implications of that financing would be for South Africa, both economically, but also geopolitically. And your book reveals, um, and you've mentioned how Zuma believed that he had been poisoned and this served to kick off the nuclear deal with Russia. He thought American intelligence agencies were behind an attempt to murder him. So briefly link up Zuma's intention to enter nuclear agreement with the Russians back in 2012 and the thought that American intelligence agencies were trying to murder him. Well, essentially, Jacob Zuma, we know when he went to the Zondo inquiry in July 2019, identified all of his political and legal problems, including the corruption trial that he continues to face, as being sourced in a sort of nefarious three-decade-long plot between so-called apartheid spies and foreign Western intelligence agencies. And he said that, you know, this plot, which allegedly involved you know, a suicide bomber trying to blow him up at a Miscondi conference, amongst other things, that, you know, that it was it was because he, Zuma, knew who the spies were, the apartheid spies were within the ANC. So we knew that, but there was this convergence of Jacob Zuma's um, sort of legacy making, what he regards as his legacy making um, campaign to have South Africa join BRICS in 2010, which is, of course, an alliance um, of Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa, and China. He very much identified that in his subsequent explanations of why he believed um, he had been poisoned as part of the reason that he had been targeted. So in Jacob Zuma's mind, and we know this through some of the interviews that he's given and statements that he's made, he believed to some degree that part of the reason that he had been targeted for this alleged poisoning, of which there seems to be no uh, forensic evidence was that you know he had aligned himself with Russia, with India, China, and and Brazil, and made it overtly what he regarded as an anti-Western statement. Certainly, when I spoke to him in 2019, his averment was very much that the West had not um, shown support for the anti-apartheid struggle. That those who pretend to be our friends are not our friends. I think was one of the statements that he used, and that the USSR as you know, had, had been through the military hospitalization of, of exiles, et cetera, demonstrated support for the anti-apartheid struggle and needed to be rewarded. So it was a convergence of a whole lot of different narratives and explanation, but fundamentally it was underpinned by this overwhelming belief that he was the target of some kind of Western apartheid spy agenda. And indeed, that anyone primarily within Treasury who opposed the nuclear deal was being driven by um, nefarious reasons that they were agents of the West, agents of apartheid, and therefore their, their questioning couldn't be seen as being done in good faith. And National Treasury did become the watchdog during his presidency, trying to stamp out irregular spending within government. And then Finance Minister Ntlantla Nene refused to sign off on financial guarantees for the nuclear deal. But then there came this 
Project Spider Web reports. Can you briefly just tell us what you think? Well, Project Spider Web, I think, came out in around July 2015, around about the same time that Mene had uh, refused to sign a, a letter that he regarded as a guarantee um, for Treasury to intervene if and when there was a scenario where um, ESCOM or the Department of Energy couldn't repay Russia for the, for the nuclear build. And it's, it then paints this picture of high-level Treasury officials, all of whom would have been integral to you know, the evaluation over the feasibility of a nuclear deal and its financing. Um, paints them as being part of some kind of weird Stellenbosch mafia um, and pushing an agenda that was essentially primarily um, driven by sort of apartheid imperatives. Nene was in it. Maria Ramos was one of the key figures. She was described as the Queen of Leaves. And of course, we know that at that time, even, there were these narratives around white monopoly capital and, you know, these nefarious kind of agendas dri driving um, driving opposition to, to some of Zuma's uh, kind of policies, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a clear attempt to delegitimize Treasury and to delegitimize people who, as Nene said, were just doing their jobs. You know, the Constitution requires that procurement must be open, transparent, and done in the interests of the South African people and of, you know, a transformative democracy. And in circumstances where Treasury officials are, are being consciously kept out of the loop and when they ask for information they are then being cast as somehow um, illegitimate apartheid spies agents of the west that is an absolute recipe for disaster and that I think was clearly the agenda behind that report. And you mentioned her before but there is a chapter in your book dedicated to unpacking former energy minister Tina Gemma Peston's role in the nuclear deal and many people were and still are under the assumption that she was a Zuma loyalist that pushed for the deal to go through. But your book paints another picture of her. And I think many would be surprised to learn about this other side. Well, what was interesting was that she was the person that signed off on that intergovernmental agreement with Russia in 2014, just a few months into office. She is a massively controversial figure, rightfully so, because of what happened with the oil reserves her time as um, Minister of Fisheries and Forestry with the whole second channel um, issue that was investigated by the public protector, which led to untold levels of poaching in the Western Cape. So there is a lot of reason for people to maybe be distrustful of her. But in regards to the nuclear deal, a number of the Treasury, current and former Treasury officials that we spoke to and within the Department of Energy said that it would be a mistake to simply write her off as a Zuma bot, that actually what she done in terms of her time in the energy department was to create a whole bunch of knots for those pushing a pro-nuclear agenda to get through. And certainly the, the documentation and the paper trail does suggest that. I mean, in 2016, right before she was fired, she actually released a draft integrated resource plan that pushed the nuclear procurement very much further down the road. Of course, it was never... Um, sort of solidified and released as a final report. But she she did do things, I think, evidently that were, she said, were aimed at delaying the nuclear procurement until such time as, quote, unquote, the courts could set it aside. And I think that was one of the most sort of powerful moments in what she said was this awareness that ultimately it wasn't going to be the ANC government or the ruling party that would stop this from happening because people were... Zuma's leadership appeared to be so all-consuming that very few people would ever directly, you know, confront him or stand up to him. And when they did, they were fired. But she had this fundamental belief, and she turned out to be right, that the saving grace in terms of South Africa and the nuclear deal would be the courts. And of course, that is what happened in 2017. And can you just tell us about the Earth Life uh, and the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute and their role in halting the nuclear deal? They are environmental um, civil rights organizations and they have you know, really focused a lot of their time and energy and litigation and resources on you know, interrogating uh, government's energy decisions and policies and procurement um, along a wide range of issues, you know, most centrally coal and nuclear. But what they did in 2015, when you know it started emerging the full details of this intergovernmental agreement 
how it gave tax exemptions to Russia, how it exempted them against any form of liability in the event of a nuclear accident, was that they went to court and they, they challenged the intergovernmental agreement and then they subsequently challenged all the other intergovernmental nuclear agreements that government put before parliament, um, including with America and I think South Korea, as a mechanism to sort of stop the procurement process from happening. Because Makoma Lakalakala, who is, is one of the, who's actually deposed to the affidavits that brought this challenge, said very wisely that what they had learned from the arms deal was that you'll be asking questions and the procurement will happen. You have to attack the procurement before it happens. And so they challenged the intergovernmental agreements. They challenged the so-called Section 34 determination, which would have allowed first of all, the Energy Department, but actually subsequently ESCOM to procure nuclear energy. And they challenged the request for information, request for proposals process that ESCOM used that Section 34 determination to proceed with. And they mounted a very apolitical case. They were consciously focused on the legal technicalities of what the government had, uh, had done, how it had not embarked on public participation, for example, the noticeable differences between the Russian 2014 intergovernmental agreement and the other ones. And they essentially shut that procurement process down in its entirety because they attacked every single step as unlawful. And they persuaded the Western Cape by court of their arguments. And in, in 2017, they succeeded in that case. And what's so fascinating is because the case was so focused on sort of legal technical dimensions. I don't know that the South African public grasped at the time just how important and enormous it was. It was argued by advocate um, David Untalta in a very, very smart way. And, you know, government chose not to appeal it. And at the time that the judgment was actually delivered, Mel and Guardian wrote about it on the front page. And it was one of the lowest selling newspapers that newspaper had, you know, that it had ever produced because people didn't understand that actually we've just been pulled from the brink of possibly one of the most potentially financially disastrous procurement processes that South Africa could have engaged in. And I think that all credit needs to go for them for what they did because they, they really used litigation in a highly effective way um, to make sure that we didn't engage in a deal that would have been disastrous for us. And you've mentioned Eskong being used in this deal, this after Gupta Associates were installed at the power utility. And we are feeling the effects of the Gupta's infiltration into ESCOM today. Can you briefly tell us how ESCOM was used to push through Zuma's nuclear deal? Well, I mean, what's fascinating is that we know in March 2015 from the Zondor report that um, Jacob Zuma and Dudu Mieni, the then SAA board chair, um, embark on this process where they remove um, four executives that you know would have been central to the nuclear project only one of them returns, Machela Koko, who then is elevated amongst the ranks of ESCOM. And he and, and uh, you know, then Brian Molefe and Anaj Singh are brought in fresh from, you know, eviscerating Transnet and utilising it as a kind of giant cookie jar for the Guptas and their network. And they then installed in ESCOM. And we see this convergence of the state capture project and the nuclear project, which is, of course, understandable because the, the Guptas had bought Shiva Uranium in 2010 in apparent preparedness for this possible nuclear deal going ahead. And they then, you know, take over from the Department of Energy, which is which has failed dismally or been been made to fail, if you if you believe Tina Jumat Peterson's version of events, um, in, in making the nuclear deal happen. And you know, as Suzanne Daniels describes in the book, Machela Koko tells her, look, we need to get this deal firmed up by, you know, the mid-2017, mid which, of course, was a few months before the, the ANC's elective conference, which, again, seismically shifted South African history. So they then, you know, we've got these board recordings where, you know, they're talking about nuclear and, and why it needs to happen and the, the engagements with Russia for financing of ESCOM for relatively small amounts. But it's very key that there was a pivotal convergence between the Gupta the Gupta State Capture Project and the Russian project. And I would argue that there is very strong evidence that the Russian deal in many respects represented the greatest attempted act of, of state capture that South Africa was stood. And it also converged with an attempt, a failed attempt as documented by Zondor to capture the national treasury. Lastly, as South Africa continues to suffer through painful load shedding, Having an inside look at the energy landscape in South Africa, what do you say to those who point a finger of blame at ESCOM's current leadership for our energy problems? 
I think that's remarkably short-sighted. And I think that it fits in with the political rhetoric of certain people who are directly responsible for where we sit. We know that, you know, for example, on maintenance, um, that there was very little to no maintenance done on, on plants. And that, you know, as part of a kind of attempt to make the Zuma administration look good, a lot of those plants were run into the ground. Um, which in circumstances where we, we now bear the consequences of it. Do we have the right to, to question some of ESCOM's decisions? Absolutely, but we need to be fair about it. They are, you can in no way ma- blame the current management of ESCOM for what is happening now. South Africa's energy woes first started emerging during the Mbeki administration. He apologized to the nation at the time for not taking note of government's own kind of infrastructure plans which stated very clearly that there would be a need for power in around 2007, 2008. That was not adhered to. Um, the ANC's love affair with coal, which, you know, in many instances can obviously, has been, has been linked to a kind of culture of patronage and, and um, you know, uh, support for politically connected individuals who may or may not have been, part, um, uh, you know, funding the party. That also has been fundamentally unhealthy. And I think that one has to recognize that someone like Andrew Dereta in taking on a lot of those deals, those patronage networks, questioning the way in which coal is supplied, um, really trying to push ESCOM out of, a, of, out of a situation because it's in a constant crisis that it, it, it engages in economically problematic um, deals. Uh, with politically connected people, they are, in many respects, it's very obvious that the man has painted a massive target on his back. So I think if, if you are going to criticize them, you need to criticize them on decisions that have been made in the present and not attempt to blame them for the kind of explosion of problems that they're essentially trying to put out right now. Um, it's it's simply not fair and it's not justified by the facts. So anyone who attempts to make that argument is, is being willfully and deceptively ignorant. That was investigative journalist Karen Mon speaking to Kruger Media's policy about her book, Nuclear, Inside South Africa's Secret Deal.